welcome back to Sidewalk Skyline Podcast. Today uh, we are going to hear a session from Andrea Chang. Andrea is with the uh, Tyndale Intercultural Ministry Center in, at Tyndale University in Toronto. And uh, have you ever uh, thought, boy, I'd love to be able to uh, do some good work in the city. I just don't know where I would get the money to do it. Uh, something along the lines of bettering the community or meeting the needs of an at-risk population. Many things that uh, could be done, but they all take money. Well, Andrea talks in this session about how to write a good grant. And uh, some people might think, well, I don't, I don't know, I'd rather just live by faith. And well, you have to live by faith, that's for certain. Uh, but there are literally millions of dollars, m multiplied millions of dollars available in Canada uh, to do social programs. And many of uh, the grants uh, are picked up by churches and ministries uh, that uh, in the name of Jesus are loving their neighbor as themselves. So this uh, session was recorded at Our City Toronto back at the end of May 2022. This is Andrea Chang. Hello, everyone. Yes, my name is Andrea Chang. Um, my assistant here, who just happens to be my husband, is passing out the handout. So I wanted to make it easy for you all to take notes if you wanted to take notes. So I do have something for you. Um, I am here with the Tyndale Intercultural Ministry Center. I work alongside Brian, so I also do the IDI, I'm an IDI um, administrator, um, as well as a researcher. And um, that is my part-time job, but I'm also an ordained minister with the CBOQ, the Canadian Baptist of Ontario, Quebec. And that is where I got my start in grant writing. Um, once I finished at Tyndale with my MTS, I ended up in Scotland, Ontario. 15 minutes from Paris, 30 minutes from London, um, working at a 150-year-old church that had 12 members in it. And it was like, God, are you sure they're not supposed to close? What am I doing here? And so it was a matter of all these ideas and things to do in the community and no money to do it with. And how we diversified was with grant writing. And I became a pro at it uh, to the point to where I've written government grants. I've helped organizations um, in the Brantford area, as well as here in the GTA, uh, find grants, as well as I've written grants for grassroots. So these are people who are not charities, who are not not-for-profit organizations. However, they're grassroots. And as long as there is someone to proctor you or to be your organizational mentor, that is a for-profit or a not-for-profit entity, um, you have no problems getting money. And so I personally have gone through that, and I just got personally awarded $255,000 from the government for a ministry that has been on my heart um, since COVID. And so the government agreed, and I found a mentor to um, take the money for C CRA roles. Um, and so I'm now able to roll out my program. Um, and so this is one of the things for the past four and a half years um, that I have done, and I'd love to share that information with other people. And so, um, and especially now during these times. So what I want to do before we get started is I want to find out a little bit about you. And since we are a smaller crowd, um, this gives us an opportunity not just to say our names, but just tell me about uh, your organization. Um, just a little bit about, you know, what kind of organization it is, and then why you chose to come to grant writing. Um, so I guess we can start right here. Okay. So I'm with Standard City Outreach. Um, it's a non-for-profit organization in the Jane Finch community. Um, we run after school, homework clubs, and summer camps for the kids. Um, so why I'm here is because we need funding for the programs, but also the staff, because we need oh. the staff to help run the programs. Yes. And so... We have a high turnover staff, so we want some stability. Sounds good. Yes, salary is huge, especially for not-for-profit profit organizations and charities. Um, and it's hard, especially if you don't have the income naturally. Mm -hmm. Where do you find it? So, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bill Ryan, and um, I'm currently with uh, Church of the Redeemer, just down, down the corner. And we have a 
program there called the Common Table. And uh, I'm in the middle, sorry. Yesterday I started writing a grant that's due next Monday. Okay. So I'm panic. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you don't have control over all the information you need to have. Yes. So there, there are 17 questions just on the registration. I have the answer for one. Wow, <laughs> yeah, start early. Else, I'm sure. um, so I'm looking at you. can hire you. <laughs> uh, that and, and I'm also the post that I started my own uh, consulting. Okay. And I'm going to need some tools. All right, thank you so much, Bill. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, I'm Dan. I'm an admissions counselor at Tyndale. Um, and Andrew was my IDI IDC. Um, I recognized you. Yes. Um, <laughs> so that was super awesome. I've done that and recommend it. Um, and uh, I am, my wife and I uh, share the role of worship coordinator at our church, Rexo Alliance. And um, we are just looking at what the future looks like um, and growing our ministry to be more inclusive and actually address um, our community's needs. Um, but also the potential of um, starting our own musical uh, group that is able to function potentially on grant money um, to meet and meet there. Thank you so much, and nice to see you in person. I yes. think we did that over we Zoom, yes. and I know it was impactful, but it was just like, I think I know him, but I don't want to make a mistake and say something and it's not him. <laughs> so nice to meet you in person. Thank you for coming. Yes. Uh, we're from Christ for Life and we run a food bank and uh, it's been nice to have the answers so it's very happy for a food bank although we have a lot of um, sponsors outside but yes. it's been nice to make property who are in Sino. Yes. Yes, thank you for being here and I've written a grant for food banks and they've been very successful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll talk a little bit. Um, anyone else want to introduce? Brian, why are you here? I know you're my teammate. But <laughs> Well, I'm an executive director for an organization, and I need to be convinced that this is worthwhile <laughs> today. So, I haven't written many grants, so convince me. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, we have that relationship, so we can talk. <laughs> all right, so, you all are here for the same reason why I got into grant writing. I was in a ministry or a program and had all these ideas, felt like God had given me you know, all these ideas, I saw the needs in the community around me, and then I took a look at our congregation and was like, how are we going to do this? Because everyone in our congregation was retired, and their income was not going anymore. So more money coming into the plate wasn't happening. And then the community around us really wasn't as involved with us as we would like for them to do. So we had to do some praying. And one of the things that we came upon was Henry Nouwen. Um, as you all know, he is a Canadian author, a theologian, Catholic priest, and professor. And he has this book called The Spirituality of Fundraising. Um, and it's actually in a PDF form. But he said the notion of fundraising is an unpleasant, is an unpleasant but necessary activity to support spiritual things. And he is absolutely correct. It's one of those situations where you have to be confident in God as you're using the resources of the world to do the things that he's called you to do. And it's okay. But with grants, you have to be careful. And so we'll get into that um, a little bit later. But one of the things, as you know, uh, with small Christian charities, whether they are a church or a parachurch organization or anything like that, we tend to have what we call a traditional fundraising model. So this is where the ED or the main staff person is personal fundraising or they have a bi-vocational job. A lot of us pastors have a bi-vocational job. We have individuals that come in and the individuals um, give money, um, but there's really not that many. And then our first go-to is always churches in the area. And we're always going to them. And everyone's going to the churches, asking the churches for money. And then the churches have to choose, what are we going to do this year? Who are we going to tell no to? Right? Who are we going to have in? And so that's pretty tough. 
that's mainly the strategies that most of us have when we're doing uh, small Christian not-for-profits. So one of the things that we have to do is diversify um, beyond the tradi traditional fundraising. And there are several reasons why um, diversification is very, very important. Now, pre-COVID, you know, things were working well. We knew the areas that we were working in. We knew the communities. We knew what they needed. And then when COVID hit and we shut down, everything switched and changed. And with that, a lot of um, our congregations became very, very small. Um, then attendance online started, people figured that out, but then it was, well, how do we give um, online? And a lot of people don't trust online giving or even online tools. So the way to get the money became a whole lot harder when COVID happened. And so a lot of us had to shift. And when it comes to online tools, that's where a lot of scams have happened. And especially with the older generation, they don't like giving. So a lot of us have been in a situation where you could get a check and somebody put some money or cash in your hand, um, but now you're not seeing them. And a lot of older people are being hit with scams. They're being targeted by scams, so they don't trust links and things like that. So a lot of our funding has gone down, and so we've had to figure out what we've needed to do. Um, there are hefty fees when it comes to online tools, where, that, where before you were getting all of your money, whereas now they're taking a percentage off the top just to process fees. So you're not getting everything that you used to. Um, and then lastly, this next generation, the generation that's, that's coming up now, the generation that they're talking about upstairs, their uh, concerns are not the concerns that we a lot of times see the concerns for, right? There, a lot of their concerns are with the environment or with social justice. And so in understanding what their concerns are, which ends up being the concerns and needs of the community, we need to be able to adjust and then find that um, those, those tools and those resources so we can adjust. So before I go further, I just want to give you all a little bit of vocabulary so you all can follow me and understand. Um, so a grant is a sum of money given to an organization does that, and they do not have to pay it back. Simple as that. It does not have to be repaid. Yes, there are requirements that you have to meet. But overall, if you meet those requirements, you don't have to repay the grant. Funders are these organizations that have the money. Um, a lot of them are known as foundations or other charities. And they're the ones that are giving away the money. And yes, it is giving it away because there is an ex expectation of they want to take it back from you. And they do this through what is called a call for proposals. All right, And a call for proposals is how the funder goes out and they advertise that, hey, we have some money that we want to give away this year or twice this year, and here's how you complete an application. So you're going to hear me using at least those three terms um, throughout our presentation today. All right, any questions so far? All right, just want to make sure I'm not talking too fast because I do have a U.S. Southern accent, and even though I've lived here in Canada for... Ten years, I still have yet to get rid of it, so I've tried, um, and it doesn't work. Um, so, moving on. The purpose of grant writing. There is a need for um, not just grant writing from the standpoint of we need money, but how I started looking at it as a way for me to be able to get what our mission and our vision and our goals were out in the community, specifically to the people that had the money not just to the people that are using the services, but to the people in the community that was just as concerned as I was about the community, and they had the finances to help out. So this is, was a way for me to be able to proclaim the vision that God had given me to others, whether they were Christian or not. It gave a way, a pointed way, for me, able to, for me to be able to say, my organization, my church, is a part of this community and I care about it and here's what we're about. You're about the same thing, same thing, can we partner together? And that is the biggest point of why I like writing grants. It's a way to get other people involved in your vision, 
um, in God's vision. Um, it can move people to become advocates for our causes. Once they see that you're out there and they're reading the information about you, yes, they're going to sit around the table and they're going to talk about you. Right? They're going to talk about, hey, did you know about this particular organization? Right? Because they're looking at your application. They're going to be saying, oh, I didn't know this. I didn't know they were here. Oh, I didn't know these types of things. And so it does get the people in the community because a lot of funding organizations, they're not people that are just far off. The people that are making the decisions are actually people that are in the community. You just don't know. And usually there are volunteers that are there. So it's really, really good when you're doing these grant applications, whether you get the grant or not, you become on their radar. The people with the money, they're able to see, hey, there is someone here doing something and this is what they do and how they do. And so that's another reason for uh, grant writing that I appreciate. Grant writing diversifies your fundraising strategies. It is a fundraising strategy. It's not something that you are going to have to rely on, but it's a strategy that helps you, uh, meaning it's not the only thing that you do, but you add to Right? So it's sort of like a person who, to make ends meet, they go pick up a second job. One job may be full-time, another job may be part-time, but put it together, they're able to make ends meet, and they're able to drop one once they're able to get more money in the one they really want to have. Right? So that's the exact same thing with fundraising. Right? So writing a grant allows you time to get your ideas funded, while you come up with a longer term strategy to fund it in the future. And in all actuality, that's exactly what funders want to see. They're willing to give you the money for a period of time as long as they see that you're going to come up with the plan not to live on that grant forever, right? And so that's another thing that I appreciated. It. And it's just like I have this idea, um, I write a grant. And I get the grant for a year or two years, but that gives me two years to come up with another strategy or how am I going to keep this going, right? And so that is another reason um, to write grants. And so now there are some very important things that you need to know when it comes to writing the grant the correct way. And that is you have to understand your ministry project. Now, all of us know our ministries, we know what we want, until you get to the grant application and it's like, whoa, where are these questions coming from? And there are some specific things that you have to have, what they call the ele elevator pitch, down to the letter, to the character on some applications. That is, who are you? Why are you doing this? What do you need? And how are you going to go about using the money? Sometimes they give you the character space. Sometimes they give you the word space. You don't know until you get into the application. But those particular four questions there are very important. Now specifically, the who includes who is your organization. You have to be ready to talk about not just your particular position, but if you are a not-for-profit organization or a charity, they want to know about your board. So you have to have your board up to date. If you're running around trying to get profiles and get things like that and it's not up to date, it's going to take you longer. So who you are is more than just you. It's the people around you that make the organization. So you have to have those things up to date before you start any application. Um, you have to have a short history of the activities that you're doing within the community. Most grants want to know what are you, where are you located and what are you doing in the community. They don't want to know where you're located and what you're trying to do out someplace else. They want to see the evidence. And the evidence is going to come from other people around you who's going to have to write a letter of support. right? And so they become a part of the who. Who have you already partnered with or done something with that's able to say, yes, I know who this organization is that's writing this grant, and I'm willing to say, yes, that they're here in this community. So all of that is a part of the who. Another part of the who that we need to think about is not just about us. It's actually about the community. A lot of times we 
write the grant from the perspective of every, um, ourselves. We need the money. We want the money. In all actuality, the funders want to know more about the community that surrounds you. They want to know about who are you serving. And if you don't know who you're serving well, if you don't understand the demographics and their needs, it's going to be hard to convince them to give you this free money. Right? So that's the two aspects of who. Next is the why. The why is important. It is a way of communicating um, what's important, again, not to you, but to the community. Right? They want to see what's important to the, com to the community and do you know that. So what are the needs? The next thing is the what. What is the big idea that you have? What is the research that you want to find out? For the food bank that I wrote um, the actual application for, it wasn't money to put on a program. It was actually money to find out from the people who visited the food bank what they wanted. What, what are some of the needs that, that you have? And so we did research. We created a survey. And when people came to show up on the different days to go through and either get the clothes or get the food, um, we also had a hot bar at the same time as well as the pantry, um, we asked, what, what, what are your needs? What are the things that you're going through at home? So we were paid. We got $75,000. And we actually was able to supplement the ED's um, salary with this grant by collecting this information. And all we did was conduct research. But the reason why we were able to get the grant is because we didn't want to go in with the idea of, oh, we know what they need. It was like, well, why don't we ask them? And so from there, we were able to write a grant. Well, now that we know what we need, here's another grant application here's what we need. And they turned around and said, yep, you collected the information, you involved the community that you were around, yes, we're okay to give you now this $150,000 to expand, to do the renovations that you need. And so it doesn't always have to be a big idea, but if you want to research the big idea, there is money out there for research as well. Um, and so that's another thing that you can do um, with the what. And then it's the matter of the how. Now most people have the how down. You talk about it in your sleep to yourself, the left brain to the right. You know how you want it to, to, to go, right? So usually that's the easiest part. But it is important because, again, you're going to be limited to character or maybe words. So you're not going to have a lot of space. All right? Everybody understands there? Any questions from there? All right. So... Now, before you go off and start writing a lot of grants, you need to figure out some things about your funder. Because not every funder is going to be an organization that you want to get money from, right? Um, because what your vision and mission and goals are has to line up with what the organization, the funder that you're getting at. Those have to match. And if they don't match, it's going to be a waste of time, right? And so this is where you do research on the funder. You look up what are their visions, what's the mission, what's the goals, what their values, do they match? Um, does it go against your church or your denomination or your organization's core beliefs or ethos? For example, um, one of the funders that are out there is the Ontario Trillium Foundation known all over Ontario, but does anybody know where they get the money from? Very good. They get it from the lottery. So they have a lot of money, and they love to give it away to people in the community. No strings attached. However, as a Christian organization, you need to understand that the money's coming from gambling. Right? Now, we know that the Lord can use anything of this world and make it holy. However, we as humans, a lot of times, we have to sit around and talk about it. And if you come from a Baptist background like me, that takes several meetings. <laughs> oh, you're getting the grant from who? Why are we doing that? I don't know. We're supporting gambling, and that means there's alcohol, that means there's cigarettes, that means there's, right, and all that goes into that. And so you have to research. Where does the money come from? 
out, right? So that's very important that you have to do to make sure that you're not spending your time writing grant applications with organizations in the end. If you are funded, they are going to ask you. Now you have to tell the world that you got this money from us. That is usually one of the requirements. When you get a grant, they want everybody in the community to know that you got money from them. And if you're not comfortable with advertising, that is one of the reasons why they can come and take the money back. Right? They don't like taking money back, but that is one of the reasons why any funder will take a money back is if you do not advertise that, hey, you were a grant recipient. So it's very, very, very important that you do your research on your funders to make sure that your core beliefs and your ethos won't have an issue or a problem. Um, and then finding out where they get their money from. All right, so now we're going to go into some fun stuff. Um, we are actually going to go into how to find grants. So I'm going to start off with what's free first because I use what's free for years. I didn't start using um, the paid subscriptions until two years ago when I could afford it. So I did a lot of research on my own using free tools. So I'm actually going to share those things with you. And I'm actually going to ask my husband to come and take the computer and click the button because I can't talk and click at the same time. I'll break something. <laughs> so he's actually going to take us to some funding um, tools. So one of the wonderful places where I went was I just went into Google and I asked Google, what are some grants in Ontario? And up came this free database in alphabetical order on all the grant organizations. Um, and so if you uh, scroll down, they actually put them in alphabetical order. So I'm uh, starting right there, number two, it says the Aboriginal Participation Fund. So I just click on it. All right. So when you click on, it goes from A to Z, it will actually tell you what the fund is, what it's about, the different things, who to contact, and see the status right down there on the bottom left hand side there? Status, it says open. That means that they are taking applications, call for proposals now. So you can go through that database, and again, A to Z, and a lot of times you can go and reorganize um, the search, and it just won't do A to Z. It would actually put it in categories for you. And so that was the first one that I ever used, and it was amazing. Um, another one, um, can you bring up Service Canada? So Service Canada, so this is the organization where a lot of us, if you've ever heard of Canada Summer Jobs Grant, so these are the people that actually do that. Again, free grant. You can hire anyone from the ages of 15 to 30. And here's the thing. During COVID, they took away the rule that you have to be in school. So when they first started giving out this grant pre-COVID, the person had to be in school ages 15 to 30, but you couldn't be an international student. Now you just have to be 15 to 30 years old. You don't even have to be in school. And as long as you're not an international student, they'll give you the money for the job. I wrote five of those grants this year already for different organizations for them, for them to get particular positions. Um, so you go in there and very easy again, what type of grant are you looking for? You know, you just fill it out. And you see there's something down there for research, there's international development, health, gender equity, indigenous people, just different things, jobs or apprentice. You know, just click one for me. Uh, let's do jobs and <clears throat> registered training. And hit continue. And then it will just start bringing up all the different pieces of information and what you can do. There are things in here for when you're working not just with children, but with elderly, um, with different BIPOC communities, um, the disabled. There's so many different grants in there. And again, it's free. You just have to go in there and research. Now, yes, this site is a government site, just like the last one. And we do have a grant course talking specifically about government grants and the myths surrounding them. 
it's not a bad deal at all. Again, and so, but I don't want to get into that because that's a whole other session. Um, but this is the, another good place to go that is absolutely free. Click of a button. Um, another one we can do, let's do the Community Foundation. So the Community Foundations is another free tool. Um, it actually is, and if you scroll down there, there should be a button that you click that says, what are all the foundations in Canada? Just scroll down some more, yep. Find a community foundation. So you can go in there and click that. And foundations, a lot of times, have grants. And they're looking for people to give the money to. And this particular database right here lets you find all the foundations within a particular area that you can go out and check their websites to say, hey, is there a grant that might fit what you're looking for? So these are just some of the free tools. Now, there are paid tools. So for example, has anyone heard of Imagine Canada, right? So they have a tool called Grant Connect. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't pull, ask you to pull that up. Yes, go ahead and do that one. Now this one's a little hefty. It's about $800 a year, but what I did was I got smart. I partnered with another organization and said, hey, can we have this? And they said, how about we find someone else and we split it in thirds? Mm -hmm. And all three of us use it. And it's a database that is Canada-wide, not just Ontario-based, but Canada-wide. Um, if you are a not-for-profit, they do give you a discount. Right? And so they do give you some money off. So when you go in and um, you do have to buy it, um, it's about 800 However, it lists every organization in all of Canada as well as those organizations around the world that give to Canadian organizations. And here's the wonderful thing. Knowing that there are several different streams they allow you to organize. So everything that I look for is in purple, my favorite color. But in another organization, their color is red. And so we're able to color code what grants that we're looking at without competing against one another for the same grant. Right? And so we split that eight hundred and it's like per year, but now it's on everybody's budget and we split that three ways and we're all able to go in and use the database. So, it's not a free tool, but it is an amazing tool. And one of the wonderful things I like about this is when you go in and you use them, they will alert you. They'll send you a, um, a prompt saying, hey, in about 30 days, there's a grant that you're interested in that's getting ready to open. And so you have 30 days to prepare, okay, I need to get my board stuff or the board changed, right? I need to make sure we get all that updated because they're going to check this. You know, do we have all of our CRA stuff updated, right? And so that's what I like about this one. Um, there's another organization out there called Grant Station. It's from the U.S. However, it is U.S.-based, and they, what they consider international is where they put Canada. You can look up U.S.-based grants that give or foundations that give money to Canadian organizations, right? And so they also allow for partnerships as well between organizations in two different countries. Um, and so that's another organization called Grant Station there. Again, it's not as hefty as the Canadian um, Imagine Canada, um, but there is a fee for that. It's several hundred dollars uh, for that one. And again, if you want to go in and uh, half it with another organization, that's half the cost um, with that. Uh, so those are the how you find the funders, right? Um, so now I want to move a little bit into research. If you don't mind uh, bringing the presentation back up. And you can just keep it. So what do you need to look for when you're researching a, a funder? Uh, you need to look at, um, we already talked a little bit about this, the mission, vision, ethos, and core beliefs of the particular organization. Um, the purpose of the call. 
So when I say the purpose of the call, it's literally why are they asking for organizations to turn in um, money? Is it because they are looking for people that are doing stuff specifically in the BIPOC community with children and youth? Are they looking for people who are doing something in the community with those who are disabled? Are they looking for someone who's doing something in the community with the elderly? They will tell you, we have this pot of money and we're looking to give it away to people who are doing this. So you do need to research because they can change directions. They can say, oh, because of COVID, we're now doing stuff for COVID. That's what Trillium did. Right? They were giving away capital grants. Capital grants is where an organization will give you money to do very large, um, very large renovations um, by land, by property, and the Trillium Foundation, again, they get the money, money from the lottery. They have tons of money to do that. Um, but when COVID hit, they stopped doing capital grants, and they put all of their money going toward rebuilding the communities. Um, how are you helping the community bounce back? How do you, as an organization, need money to bounce back to be able to help the community in a new way? Um, and so you have to pay attention to what are the call for, for proposals are. So those are very, very important. Um, you can also look up who have been giving these grants before. So remember how I told you when you get a grant from particular organizations, all of them want you to advertise well, they advertise on their end as well. So when you advertise, um, when they advertise that they gave you a grant, you're going to be on a list where people can see your name, so you can't hide it, <laughs> right? And so you can go on to that list to see who are other people that have gotten this grant. And when you click on that name, it would give you a short bio of this is who got the grant last year, and this is what they did. And a lot of times what you can do is just call an organization up and say, hey, I see last year or a particular you know, time you received this particular grant. You know, can you tell me a little bit about the process? Right? And that kind of thing. A lot of people are willing to share information. All right? Um, but yes, so you can check out, not just that, you can also check out how much money they were given. So let's say you need $50,000, but this particular funder only gives up to twenty five. dollars you may not know that until you do some research on the funder and you find, okay, I see on the average, this is how much they give. Or they may say 25, but you see, oh, wait a minute, they gave an organization 100,000. How did they get that 100,000? And it turns out they went for a different grant stream. So again, during research, you realize, oh, this organization just doesn't do this stream. They do several different things. And which one do I want to go for? So those are some of the things that are very important. The requirements to apply. This is where you need to fill out an application, right? You think, oh yes, great, simple. It's not simple because you need certain information, you need documents, and if you don't have those available already, then it's what they call the application is incomplete without it. So again, when you're able to do your research ahead of time, even when you're just thinking, hey, I'm thinking we're going to need some help with this. Let me do some research. You go through the free tools and you identify there's five grants that you like. You need to go in there and start doing the research. That's what you do. These are some of the things that you're researching. Is What are the requirements for me to be able to um, apply? There are some requirements that say, okay, you can be an organization, a not-for-profit organization, but you can't make over 250000 a year. Or you have to make over two hundred and fifty thousand a year, right? Those are requirements that things that you need you need to know. All right. Um, and so, uh, next thing is, how do you organize all this information? Um, that is very important. Now, again, being from a small church, didn't have a lot of extra money sitting around. Excel spreadsheet. Now all of a sudden you got this thing called Google Sheets. Right, and so all that's free, really, really, really easy. Just alphabet alphabetize your grants, just start off with A. You're finding grants that fit your ethos, your vision, your mission, just put them all on the spreadsheet. Right, whether you're going to apply this year or next, put them all on the spreadsheet. 
right? That That's very, very important. But what are some other things that need to go on there? Number two, do they give money for salaries? That is on my spreadsheet, hands down. I'm always looking for a way to bring on either up my salary or bring on someone else to help me work with the salary. So that's one of the things that I'm looking for. I don't want to spend time filling out this 20 page application for a grant and it turns out they cannot say yes yeah, sorry you look like you're looking for salaries and we don't give salaries but thanks anyway right I just spent 10 hours 15 hours and all this time and if I had done my research earlier I never would have applied for that grant because they don't give money toward salaries um, and so that's one of the things that I put on my Excel spreadsheet is do they do salaries Another thing that I look out for that's very, very important is uh, what are the reporting requirements? Meaning, they give you the money. They just don't give you the money and say, okay, see ya. No, you're going to have to do a report. Well, how often do you have to do a report? Now, most only require that you do a report at the end of your grant year. But there are some that say, no, in the middle, we want to know what's going on. So like when I did the food bank grant and we were doing the research, they wanted to know in the middle. Now here's what happened. In the middle of that research, guess what happened? COVID. So we went from people coming in, oh, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. We weren't taking people's names or anything. We would just you know, put an X here and then a lot of them couldn't write. And so it was a situation where we would ask the question to them and we would write their answer down for them, right? But then COVID hit. What happened to our research? So we called up the organization said, hey, look, we're still going to continue. However, um, we may need to get, do more door-to-door. -door. We may need to do telephone. We may need to do Zoom. And they said, well, you know what? You can allocate some of the money from you driving around um, or because we were doing focus groups as well. And focus groups always work when you have food, right? Everybody comes and has an opinion. Well, because we weren't able to meet in the middle of COVID, we had a piece of the budget that was going toward food. Well, they were like, you know what? Use that money to go towards Zoom. So we were able to get a professional Zoom account that even though the research is over, we still have today because of that grant. Um, and so it's one of these situations where um, you need to be able to understand what you're looking for and if they're able to provide it. So it's not just salaries, but it's also reporting and is there room to wiggle in the budget, meaning if you need to shift? And a lot of them do put that up front in the requirements so you know what you're dealing with. I'm going to stop right there really quick just to see if there's any other questions you may have because I am going to go to one more tool. Any questions, anybody? I'm curious if you have any experience with uh, the Canada Arts Council? Yes. Okay. I do have some experience. I've written one grant with them, okay. the Canada Arts Camp Council. Um, any other questions? Is it um, worth it to have your own grant writer on staff? What are like the pros and cons? Because you could get somebody then to get money and you, you're, make your organization sustainable, yeah. but at the same time, yeah. Yeah. Well, here's what I say. A grant writer is only someone that's able to sell your services. So if you have someone that writes really, really well, you don't need to get a someone on the outside. However, as a caveat, it's more than just writing. Um, it's also this person has to be able to get the documents, do the research, and all those types of things. So what I tell people all the time is try it on your own. You know your services and your ministries better than anybody. Try it on your own. And then have an editor, somebody that can come behind you and make sure that you answered all the questions. Now, that's another course. That, so this is just the introduction. This is part one of a series of five. Right? And so... Um, this, I think, is on the tips, uh, the tips one, which um, I'll go through with you guys. Matter of fact, let's just go ahead and do that now. So Grant Writing 201 um, is you talk about the language that you use, remembering the mission. 
tone matters. Um, learn to tell your stories and answer the question. So Grant Writing 201 is how to write a grant without selling your soul, right? And honestly, that that's, that's true because a lot, especially us Christian organizations, we feel like we're selling our souls to the devil or that we're compromising in some way. And so one of the things that I teach you in 201 is answer the question. So if you're writing the grant yourself and you're deep in it, what I say, once you're done with it, pass it off to someone else in your organization that's able to go through did you answer all the questions or did you go off on a tangent and totally miss it? And so, again, these are people that you're not paying. These are people that are already there. But I say if you're not going to pay someone to do it, and most grant writers have two sets of eyes on it. So even if you pay a grant writer, they always have someone else on their staff that's going to look at the grant by, to make sure all the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, um, everything is clear but all the questions are answered. Um, so what I tell people is, so here's how I do it. If I know someone's on a budget, I'll tell them, take a crack at it. And then once they pass it through, maybe someone on their board, then I come through and my biggest thing is, did you answer all the questions? And so the only thing that they do is I charge per hour not for writing the grant, but just going through, making sure. And if there's something that was unclear, all I do is highlight it and send it back to you and say, this was unclear. And if it's unclear to me, it's going to be unclear to them. You're going to lessen your chance of, of um, getting the money. So hopefully that was, that was helpful there. Any other questions before I go on with other courses? Lots, but I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I joined it. Yes. I'm still sitting behind the camera, but um, I self funded a series on addiction. Yeah, because I got skin in the game. I've got a son that's a cool guy. And um, so I've got a, a situation where just before COVID, I interviewed 15 or 20 addicts that are recovering and otherwise. The series is actually out now. We're doing one a week. It's called Family Stop the Harm. It's about stigma and all that. Hmm. And I'm thinking, I should have got a grant for this. Yes, sir. And I know it's a hot button issue right now because yes. a lot of people have skin in the game. Yes. Know? And I thought, you know, as a Christian too, how can I use my skills that I've acquired over my life in television and that to not just help families, um, but help with the stigma that addicts are going through. Yes. So is, is, that a, is that something that is like a hot button issue right now in the grant? Absolutely. And what has exasperated the hot button issue is COVID. Because a whole lot more people have found themselves addicted or have gotten triggered or traumatized and have fallen back into. And so there is money all over Canada for addictions. Because okay. we want to continue the series. Um, so I guess we need to talk. Absolutely, absolutely. And so here's the wonderful thing about, about Tyndale. The sole purpose on Tyndale being in existence, as Brian probably said earlier in his thing, is specifically to help um, churches and specifically Christian organizations, small Christians organizations that don't have the budgets um, to do this kind of stuff. And grant writing is something that is new to Tyndale because we're having to do it ourselves as well. And so Tyndale University in all actuality has created a department specifically to help with this. Um, most of the grants come out of the Tim Center Normally I am the grant writer because I work part-time for Tim Center, but now we're bringing this on as a part of our um, consultant division. Um, so this is also under where we're doing the IDI and things like that as well. Um, and so another hot topic issue is just anything dealing with diversity, specifically when it comes to racism. Um, and so a lot of times diversity, equity, inclusion, or justice, Jedi, justice, equity, um, diversity, and inclusion 
Um, what's included in that is cultural sensitivity, the stuff that Brian was talking about in his course today. So that's another hot button issue that regardless of whether you're a Christian or not, Canada has said we, we're willing to give money to help for this. So there are private organizations, there are public organizations, there are government organizations, and right now some of the hottest buttons are addictions and anything dealing with diver diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what I tell people is, like you were talking about with children, correct? And so it's a matter of what can you teach children about diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? We're here in the GTA, right? There are children everywhere we go to school, but there's a lot of shootings and stabbings, right? Things going on. What can we do about cultural sensitivity to teach? So you're working with children, but this is something that you can add to and get a grant for, right? And then in doing your research, it's a matter of, I know I'm going to want to get a salary. I'm going to want to pay someone to come in. I want to pay um, an addictions counselor to come in, a psychotherapist to come in, right? I'm going to need to have money to give them a, um, a consultant fee. You know, these are the kind of things that you can look up. Um, just off the bat, those are two hot button issues right there that you can go for. So, like with the Tim Center, if you're an organization and you attended Brian's um, workshop earlier today and he was saying, hey, we're able to give um, your entire organization, go through, give this training, the IDI, yes, it's going to cost money. Tim Center will actually help write a grant to, and it's called Capacity Building in the world is called capacity building to help your organization build capacity on how to work with people that are different than you. Right? And so it's all in the matter. It's like what I was saying with grant um, writing 201, language matters. Right? And so it's how you say what you're saying that connects with the people that are giving the money that they say, oh, I like what this guy is doing over here. Right? And so they're like, hey, you know, we're going to invite you back to the next round because that's, we, we want to hear a little bit more about that. Um, one of the addicts, recovering addicts, is transgender. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been in the community for years. And the Yeah. So I'm playing this myself. I know when I do client work in 4K, work, I charge like 3500 to finish minute. And so I, the Lord just led me to do it. It's like, I'll, I'll provide it. But, you know, I'm not saying but. I mean, yeah, yeah. Providing. Yes. Yeah. And, and, um, but to put it out there would enable me to do more. And, yes. And not even scratching the surface. Not even scratching yeah. the but what you're talking about right now, Grant Writing 201, learn to tell the story. In Grant Writing 301, digital tools to tell the missional story. What you're talking about right there. Grant Writing has moved from just writing an application to where they want to see a video. Do you see what I'm saying? They just want to see a compelling story. And if you get six people around a boardroom, Looking at that because it's a link on your application and they're all crying, your chances of going to the next level are huge. Like I cry when I edit them. You know, because now I know these people because they were there in front of me while we were chewing. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I relive that and then I personalize it to my own son who's struggling with the same thing. Yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yes? Sorry. Google the site. What's IDI? IDI. Sorry. So that is Intercultural Development Inventory. Um, so what that is is an assessment that helps you see um, how you view the world uh, based on patterns of commonality and differences. So you're going to view the world from all of your experience against um, what else is out there, what you have in common and what you don't have in common. And then it's an assessment that also from that um, addresses whether or not 
um, if you judge the difference or do you adapt with the difference. So that's what the IDI is. Um, so Tyndale uh, does that a lot. I apologize. Not everybody took my course. Oh. <laughs> the course was in here. Um, so yes, Brian, I know you have some more questions. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, so, a couple of questions. So, mm -hmm. you did um, research grants for church planting. I wonder how many, so you had an Excel sheet you're talking about that. I wonder how many, how many you found uh, that were, yeah, that were good. And yeah. I have another question. Yeah, so, how I, the language, again, grant writing 201 that I used um, when trying to find grant money in church planting was I moved into a new community and I started off first as research. So I wanted to do an ethnographical study. Now anyone knows that we call it in church planting um, mapping, right? So, but in the grant world, they don't know what mapping is. But if you say I want to do research, go in, out in the community, so that's how I was able to get that, that first grant. Um, the second grant actually came from my denomination. They were just like, oh wow, this is, this is pretty neat, um, but we don't want you on this forever. Um, and so it was a situation where I was able to get the grant, find out what the community needed and if they were willing to pay for it, and then I was able to come off the grant, and then the um, program became self-sustaining, and that was actually with children. In a very small community, a thousand people only lived in this small village. There were like five churches, and everyone was going out of business, and there was this, our little Baptist church. The Catholics had already left. The Anglican only had two members in it. And so it was just us and the um, United Church. And it was a matter of we had all these young farming families around us, but all the churches were dying. And so went to the school, because we did have one elementary school, went to the school and said, what do you need? And they said, well, you're a church, what can you do? We're not going to allow you to come in here and preach. We're like, oh, that's not what we want to do. My husband was like, well, I know how to play chess. And I'm like, well, I have a bunch of elderly people that know how to sew and cook. We can teach that. And they were like, done. Then they said, well, you know, if you write the grant for us, we'll get the money. And it was a school grant. And we got the money. And then we got the money again. And the next thing you know, a partnership started coming. And then the government came in and said, okay, what is this church over here doing? And so that's how it turned into. But it wasn't about the church. Remember what I said earlier? It was about the who, which wasn't us. It was about the community. And because, yeah, exactly. And they were just like, okay, they're not trying to go out there and have people become a Christian. Yeah. They're out there trying to bring two generations, how I, how I worded it, the older generation that lived in the community and had been living there. I had people in my church that had been there for 50 years, five zero years, since they were 18 years old. Got married there, choir, the whole nine yards, right? And then you got this elementary school, these new people that moved into the community, and I wanted to bridge the gap, the intergenerational gap. Right? Ended up having three grants that year. I was able to buy, I mean, um, hire a children and youth worker. Not just for the summer, but for three years straight. In this little tiny 1,000 village, 1,000 member village. Right? But that's where I learned language management. How, what is it that the funders are looking for that I have that without going out there, you know, saying, well, you know, um, respect your elders, but putting, you know, because that's what it says in the Bible, but putting in a way, I'm trying to bring two generations together. The older generation has something that the younger generation um, doesn't have, but they need, but their parents don't have time to give it because they're working. So the after school program became that. And then it turned into a lunch program during the day. And then it could be, any other, any time of the day, anyone from our church wanted to show up, we were welcomed. So, yeah. What else? Any other questions? Here's another one. Grant writing 401. 
how to manage a grant once you get it, report writing, documentation, financial record keeping, staff capacity, example of requirements. This is the newest one, Grant Writing 501, the myths of government grants. There's a lot of myths in people thinking the government's the devil, <laughs> right? But even Jesus had to work with people that he knew in the end. But he's like, you know what? It's all about me moving the kingdom forward. I'm not going to deal with the Pharisees right now, right? He had to learn how to use the Pharisees when he could use the Pharisees, ignore them when he needed to ignore them. But most of the time, he used the Pharisees to start conversations, spiritual conversations. So in my case, the government ended up being my partner. Right? And so I talk a lot about how to partner with the government, again, without feeling like you sell your soul. But, yes. So, any other questions outside of that? How, how often do you mention that you're a Christian organization in your grant writing? And in my vision. With, okay. In my vision and mission, that's it. That's it. Okay. That's it. I can't deny, if I have a CRA number... That's charity status. They're going to look me up anyway and see it, right? Because you have to turn that in, right? So I don't hide that in my vision and mission. But after that, I don't mention it anymore because my whole purpose, and again, this is in um, Grant Writing 201, remember the mission. Even Jesus didn't get everybody saved, right? But what's the mission? Why do I want this money to do the grant? That's the mission, right? Jesus would have loved everyone to accept him, but there are others he just had to just, hey, you got your healing, right? You may end up going to hell later, but you got your healing, right? He remembered the mission. And that was Andrea Cheng. Uh, on our next episode, I'm going to have a conversation with Bill Riley. Uh, if you watch uh, any of our episodes on YouTube, you know that uh, Bill Riley uh, from Stone Throw Media is uh, the producer of the video segments. Uh, so uh, we're going to take a look back at having an eye for the city, uh, what his uh, experiences as a videographer and uh, interacting with so many of uh, the guests that we've had on the podcast, uh, being uh, on site in different cities and uh, just as a lifetime uh, in the media industry uh, some of the realities of uh, doing media in the city so uh, join us will you for the next episode of sidewalk skyline podcast as usual you can uh, refer to our show notes on the website to be able to get uh, links to our guests until next time, I'm Kevin Rogers, and you've been listening to Sidewalk Skyline Podcast.